<laughs> so, uh, how many remember college days, things you did and you weren't smart? I always wonder how any man ever gets married. Amen. You just wonder about that because I think there's a time in life that God blinds the mind of the woman until after the I do, and then she wakes up and all of a sudden, sorry, we're married, take it away. <laughs> I've often reminded my wife, no divorce, sorry, can't do that. <laughs> so uh, during the light to be with you today on this cold winter's day, and uh, actually we got more snow than you all did. I think we have between 10 and 12 inches where we're at, so I appreciate your prayers tonight as we travel home. Uh, we do have four-wheel drive, praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Hopefully it'll, it'll warm up a little bit or enough to melt off a little bit. Uh, but we're excited to be with you today. Uh, before we get into God's Word, I do want to mention a couple of our resources. We have a resource table in the back, and I love to bring books to churches and try to be a help to folks on um, things that we have read that have helped us. And so I just want to mention briefly a couple of resources that we have today. Uh, this is a book that I've been after the author for some time to republish. I had a copy for probably the last 15 years. It's a great book that I had read in my own library. And I reached out, probably got a hold of this man's son, and I said, can I get the number of your dad? I'd, I'd like to even get the rights to print it myself. I'll reprint it. I just, the book needs to be done. Uh, it's called The Trail of the Bible. So oftentimes you'll, you'll meet someone that they don't know why we use a King James Bible or why we use, what makes our Bible the right Bible. Uh, there are books out there on that, but some of them are about that thick. Mm -hmm. So most people don't want to attack them. And so this, for a layman's copy, is, is a great book. It's, it's really only about 115, 120 pages. Mm -hmm. And it trails the Bible from the apostles till today. Amen. It shows the two lines of thought. One came from Alexandria, which is a picture of Egypt, picture of the world. Amen. And one started with the apostles, okay, Amen. in Antioch. And Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch. And so it gives us the idea. In fact, I had a man that I actually led to Christ, and he bought an NIV and was reading that, and didn't know the difference. And he said, well, what's the difference between the two? And I tried to explain to him, and, and he was listening. And I said, here, Matt, read this book. He came back two weeks later and said, wow. So it's, it's a great resource. It's a great help. Maybe you have someone or a friend that, that maybe is having trouble with Bible versions or you want something from your library. That would be a book that maybe would be a help to you. And then I also have uh, several booklets. These are smaller booklets, very, very thin booklets, written by a lady by the name of Debbie Pride, P-R-Y-D-E, and uh, just a great, great author. In fact, she, read, uh, she wrote a book uh, some years ago on uh, on pride and uh, the root of anger. In fact, the title of the book was Why Am I So Angry? Mm -hmm. And I had a friend actually send me that book. I don't know why he sent it to me, but he, <laughs> he called me one day and said, I just read this book. This book blew me away. Jason, you need to read this book. And it's about temper and it's about pride and mm -hmm. both of which I have a problem with. And I said, no, that's okay. I'll pick it up. Somewhere. He goes, no, no, I'm mailing it to you. It's already in the mail. And I'm telling you, this book chewed me up and spit me out. I'm doing it was powerful. And so I met her a couple years later at a conference, and she writes smaller booklets. Uh, this one's on the amazing power of forgiveness. Uh, this one's called The New New Narrow Path to Freedom on Addiction. Maybe you know someone that's having a problem with addiction. Mm -hmm. A tremendous book. This one's on hope when you want to end it all on suicide. Maybe mm -hmm. you know someone that's battling that in their life. This would be a book that would help them. This, this one's on unspotted by the world, about worldliness and staying away from the things of the world. So uh, I encourage you, as your pastor's already said, to read. My father told me early on in life, be a reader. Amen. Two things change you to make you better a year from now than you are today, other than your walk with the Lord Jesus. The people you meet and the books you read. Right. You say, well, I read. No, you scroll. Yeah, come on. That's not reading, Amen. okay? Amen. Read. It will help you, okay? Amen. Take it in. Let it be a help to you. I want to mention one other resource. I believe we have seven of these in the set. I just brought one of them. Brother Newman is a great friend of ours. Some tremendous books for little kids. Maybe you have grandchildren. Maybe you have three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds in the home. This is great for home devotions with them, okay? This book is the one he wrote. I, I love mentioning this one. He has one on Bible symbols and Bible families, and uh, this one's on Bible stories. This one's on Bible questions and different questions that children ask. I mentioned it yesterday in the teacher training. Uh, did God create dinosaurs? And it's uh, biblically how to answer a young person talking about the Trinity. How can God be three people at the same time? Uh, how can I be happy when everything's going wrong? How does Jesus fit in my heart? How do I hide God's word in my heart? Uh, well, where do animals go when they die? Biblically, from the Bible, it gives biblical answers to these type things. So I encourage you to get uh, the set and, and be a help 
uh, to your children and your grandchildren. Uh, maybe, in fact, we knew a lady that ran a Christian daycare. She said, I'd like to get the set and use it in, in my daycare for, for our little ones. So if we can be a help to you in any way, my wife will be at the resource table. We've also got books on, on uh, helping you be a better teacher. If you teach in any format, young people all the way up to adults. Uh, we've got some information on the table as well. We've got a missionary stories, all kinds of things like that. If we can be a help to you in any way, please let us know. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. And once you get your place there to Matthew 7, I want you to hold your finger and go to Psalm 1. We're going to read just a few verses in Matthew 7, and then we'll spend the rest of our time this morning in Psalm 1. Uh, I love to laugh. I love uh, life. Uh, some people are sticks in the mud. I'm Amen. not one of those. Amen. Okay, I, I love to laugh. Uh, I, I love life. In fact, Amen. if I'm going to watch an old movie, usually it's a comedy. I like to watch funny movies. I don't like movies that at the end of the movie you want to hang yourself. I'm just, I'm just not one of those people, okay? Uh, I'm definitely not in for horror movies and things like that. I don't. I hate it when the end of the movie is just, you want to end your life. It's just it's horrible, okay? People are like, wasn't that a good movie? No, I'm not watching it again. That was a waste of my life. I'm not doing that. But I love to laugh. And, and Christians should have a smile on their face Amen. and joy in their heart because yes. of what Jesus has done for them. Uh, I say often as I travel as an evangelist, sometimes I'm in two or three churches a week, uh, I, I say often uh, that I have a unique perspective because I'm in a lot of different places and I see a lot of things, especially in the fundamental realm. And again, when I start seeing something that there's a need for, the Lord will begin to work on my heart and my own personal life. And so that's where many of the messages that I get, God gives them to me because I want to be a help to the church. Uh, many of you know what a pastor is. You have one. Many of you know what a missionary is. You support them. I see their letters on the wall when you come in. But many people don't know what an evangelist is. An evangelist has a job. My job is to come alongside the church and edify that church, to help that church. Sometimes, again, I see things going on that you haven't seen because I'm in a lot of churches. I see Thing trends taking place, things happening, and so I'm here to be a caution. Watch out, I'm seeing this. Watch out, I'm noticing this. Okay, now, by the way, we all have the Word of God, okay? And we should be in the Word of God, and it can be a help to us. And again, I'm not your pastor, nor will I try to be. That is a special office that God has called him to. Uh, I believe that God gives every pastor a pastor's heart, Amen. a shepherd's heart. Uh, I'm not saying that God will not have me pastor one day. Be careful saying, well, God, I'm never going to do this or I'm never going to do that. Uh, God's notorious for calling you to do that, okay? <laughs> but currently, God has not given me a pastor's heart. I jokingly say very often that I could probably not be a pastor right now. I probably wouldn't have two or three people in my church. My wife probably wouldn't come. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a very cut and dry person. I'm one of those people, get in or get out, okay? Most pastors can't say that, okay? I remember being an assistant pastor for six years under my father and my grandfather, and I remember my grandfather calling me in the office one day, and he said, sit down. I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. He said, son, you cannot go around a church lopping people's heads off. Put your sword away. I'm just sitting there taking it. It's my boss and also my grandfather. You can't walk up to people and tell them to leave church. I wasn't saying anything. So well, there's some people in the church right now, they're backbiting, they're causing trouble, they're talking about the preacher behind his back, they're causing dissension, and can't we tell him to leave? <laughs> he said, no, you can't. I said, well, you can't, but I can. Here am I, send me, I'll tell him. <laughs> so he had to help me. He said, no, you can't do that. You can't go around. <laughs> I was one of those people that if I thought, thought something was wrong, I just said, well, we'll take care of this. Bye, <laughs> get out. You can't do that to people. I may have learned that you have to be nice to people. I'm still learning that, okay? But I do have a love for people in my heart, and God has given me a love to help people. And I want to be helped here this morning in our, our morning service. And I hope you'll allow the Holy Spirit to do something in your heart and in your life. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 16, a very familiar uh, three or four verses, five verses. Uh, if you've been saved or in church any length of time, you can probably quote a couple of them. Maybe you know where we're going. I want to read them to you, and then we'll go to Psalm 1. Matthew 7, verse 16, the Bible says this. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, 
You shall know them. How many of you have heard that before? So if someone claims to be a Christian and there's no fruit on their tree, they could be deceived. They could think they're a Christian and they're not. There are some that act like they're a Christian and they're not. But by their fruit, the Bible says, you know them. Right. Now, if you have a fruit, in your, a fruit tree in your backyard, maybe you planted it a couple years ago, you know in the beginning it doesn't produce much. You're going to watch that tree. You're going to fertilize that tree. You're going to groom that tree, if you will. And hopefully you're going to see that thing start to bear fruit. If after several years it never bears anything, not one piece of fruit, you would decide that something is wrong with that tree. Wouldn't you agree? You see, listen, I need to intervene here. It is possible that tree did not take root, and it's actually not alive, but it's dead. Yeah. The Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. I want you to look now at Psalm 1. The book of Psalms is a tremendous book. Oftentimes, the Israelites would quote these psalms or sing these psalms as they went in and out of battle. Sometimes David, the psalmist, wrote them. Sometimes Moses was the, the writer by, used by God to write the psalms. But, of course, many psalms. But we're looking at Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 is one of my favorite psalms. I memorized it when I was a child. It is a great psalm. The first couple of verses, verses 1 through 3, deal with the godly person. Verses 4 through 6, deal with the ungodly people. By the way, psalms and proverbs all, often do that. They do a contrast. The foolish man does this. The wise man does this. The scorner does this, the prudent does this. There gives, gives a comparison. I'm not going to take the time for verses 4, 5, and 6 because we don't have the time. I want to focus really on verses 1, 2, and 3 this morning. And in the light of Matthew chapter 7, dealing with this idea of by their fruits you shall know them, I want to look at Psalm 1. Verse number 1, to start out with the first word, a good word by the way, the word what? Blessed or blessed. How many can say today, preacher is 2024, 20, the first Sunday, I'm a blessed person. Would you be honest? Lift your hand. Yeah. I'm a blessed person. Now, we can always find something to complain about. We always can. We're, we're good at complaining. But if we be honest with our lives and look at what we have, we're blessed people. Amen. We're blessed people. I never forget being about uh, 12 years of age. My father said one time, he came to the living room and said to me and my sisters, I had four sisters, no brothers. I was the oldest, praise the Lord. Um, he said, we're talking about family vacation this year. I thought, yeah, family vacation. You know, he said, where are we going to go this year for family vacation? And dad said, it's time you guys learn how the rest of the world lives. I'm taking you to Haiti. <coughs> so for family vacation, we took 10 days and we went to the country of Haiti. I'll never forget that trip. When I came back from the country of Haiti, for the next two weeks, I had a hard time eating. I would just sit and look at my food and cry. I saw people with distended stomachs and children that were starving to death. In fact, to this day, my wife and I, we have four children. God has blessed us. But my children are not allowed to look at their food and say, I don't like that. I don't put up with that in my home. Now, I'm not saying kids don't have allergies and people don't have preferences. We all have like certain things more than others. I'm not saying that. But when someone says, my child can't eat that, eat, can't, or won't. Yeah, amen. Well, he can't eat peas. Sure he can. He's just not hungry enough. That's right. Amen. Don't feed him for three days. I guarantee you he will love peas. Amen. True. That's, right. That's a separate series of messages. We won't get into that, okay? <laughs> but we are blessed people. I learned that at a young age. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree, the Bible says, Planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, listen, shall prosper. Now, verse 4 starts in, the ungodly are not so. And then it goes on and says, verse 5, therefore the ungodly shall do this. So the last three verses are dealing with the ungodly, but the first three are dealing with the godly person. So in other words, verses 1 and 2 tell us about this godly person, and then verse 3 is kind of a visual that God gives us. He says, let me, let me explain a little further about this godly guy, this godly person, this godly character we're talking about here. Verse 3 says, he's going to be like a tree. So he's giving us a visual to look at in our mind to understand. And he says, because he's godly, he's going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth this fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, anything he does, it's going to prosper. It's going to prosper. I would say that the righteous person, the blessed Christian, the one we're talking about here, the godly person, 
They focus on their relationship and their fellowship with God more than anything else in life. Would you say that's yeah. an accurate statement? Yeah. You say, preacher, yeah, I agree with you. If a person's going to be godly, the most important thing in their life would be their focus is their relationship with God. Yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. I would agree with you on that. His delight or her delight, their joy, their goal, their purpose is in the word of God. They live there. By the way, if you're a Christian, a young Christian, and you haven't figured out that this is where you need to live, this is the essence of life. Amen. It's everything. Amen. Right. Listen, I know you hear this all the time. I know you have a good preacher. But he cannot overemphasize the importance of this book. This is food. Amen. Yep. This is light. Yep. This is ammunition. This is protection. This is shelter. This is a shield. I can keep going and going and going and going and going. This is warmth on cold days. It is everything. You see, a well, preacher, it covers the basics, but I mean, it doesn't, you know, help you with a marriage. Yes, it does. A yeah. preacher, I mean, it doesn't help you raise your kids. Yes, it does. Yeah. Well, preacher, let's deal with physical things. Like financially, I mean, it can't help you financially. Yes, it can. Yeah. Well, preacher, I'm talking about running a business. Yes, it can. You cannot think of something that this cannot help you with. Yeah. Principles in this book help you with everything in life. It is the source for the Christian. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, preacher, that's good preaching. Uh, we already know that. We already know that. Unfortunately, the person that lives here today, this godly person that Psalm 1 is talking about, is the minority today. That's right. yeah. yes, sir. Now, I find this as I travel. I'm in a lot of churches. A lot of churches. No, the majority of the rest of the believers, they focus not on fellowship with God, but on something else. Please stay with me. I hope this message convicts you as God has used it to convict me. When we walk into an auditorium, a local church, of which, by the way, the building is not the church you are. Amen. I'm not a member of this church. I'm a member of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Winchester, Virginia. Maybe you're a member of this church. When you walk into this church, you know other people see you. They know you. And so you have a choice to make. If they look at your life and you claim to be a Christian and they see no fruit, red flag. You don't want them to see that. So you have to do something about it. Either you have to produce fruit, right? By the way, there's only fruit produced one way. There's only one way. If you don't have fruit and you're not willing to do it the way that God wants you to do it, you have to fabricate it. That's what I see today. As I travel across America to our churches, I see Christians that are fabricating fruit. You know why? They don't want their fellow Christians to see their lies and see that they're not producing the fruit. Anyone would look at them and know that, hey, there's no fruit produced in their life. They're not really what they say they are. I don't want people to see that. So when I come in, I want people to see fruit on my tree. So I can't take the time to do it the right way, being in on my knees in prayer, spending time in the Word and growing properly as a Christian. I'm busy with life. So what I'll do is maybe I can cut the corner and just get some fruit on the tree. People think I'm... Godly, but really I'm not. After all, none of us are what we should be. And so we compare ourselves to others. Right. Yeah. And we fabricate fruit. Mm. So many so-called Christians today are not producing real fruit. And since we don't, we imitate real fruit not knowing why we're not producing. We simply have forgot that there's no lasting life or fruit, listen to me, apart from the root. Amen. Unfortunately, today, Christianity is the brief effort of the severed branch to bring forth its fruit in its season. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, I am not the brightest bulb in the box, but a severed branch cannot bear fruit. Amen. Right. You cut a branch off your fruit tree in your yard and throw it on the ground, and you're waiting for it to produce fruit. I hate to tell you this. I'm not a great farmer. You're not going to get any fruit. That's right. Maybe you're digging around a fruit tree. Maybe you're putting something in, landscaping, whatever. And all of a sudden, you're worried that maybe you did something you shouldn't have. That tree's showing signs of losing life. You know what? When I was digging, perhaps I messed up with the what? Root system. Maybe I cut into the root. I severed that. And because of that, the tree died. There's no longer the fruit that needs to be there because something happened. Because a severed branch cannot bear fruit. Today, pragmatism is the goal. Today, truth, we say, is whatever works. If it gets results, it must be good. Amen. I travel across America to different churches and I find this, preacher. 
Pastors and churches today are tested by this one word, success. Yeah. Is your ministry successful? How many are you running? Are you online? Do you have this? Do you have that? Time out. Time out. Who judges success? Is there a board of people somewhere or is it God? Amen. Oh. No, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Amen. But it doesn't last. And why doesn't it last? The reason it doesn't is because the focus is on the fruit instead of the root. Amen. This is a very simple message, but I hope it helps you today. Yeah. I brought a piece of fruit with me today. This is a what? It's not a trick question. Anyone want to take a guess? See if you're awake in church. Anyone? It's an apple. Who said that? A gala. See, the lady even knows her apples. Come on, people. Step on up. <laughs> right? Now, each one of us know that this is an apple. Now, there are different types of apples. We're not going to get into that because we don't have a lot of time, and it's Sunday. And Sunday is the one day of the week where the hum, we're the hungriest of all the days of the week. I am anyway, okay? On Sunday evenings after church, I don't know how about you guys, but I can eat a small restaurant. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I figured it out. I think you've taken so much food in spiritually that your body's trying to keep up. You're like, listen, I've been, I gotta have some food, you know. I can eat, I can eat a whole restaurant. So I won't get into all the different types of apples, even though there's only one kind that's the best. <clears throat> and since I'm preaching, my favorite apple is a Fuji. Maybe you like a different one. The altar is open. Right? <laughs> my mother likes Granny Smith. She likes sour apples. I love Fuji apples. The first time I remember having a Fuji apple, I was preaching a meeting in Wyoming, and we were doing a very spiritual thing one afternoon. We were glassing for mule deer, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and the preacher said to me, hey, would you like an apple? And I said, sure, that'd be great, thanks. He handed me this apple. I really didn't pay attention to it. It was an apple, a little bit smaller. It wasn't that big. I bit into this apple, and all I remember is my feet were getting wet from the juice. I mean, the juice coming out of this apple was unbelievable. And I was just, just diving into this apple, and I said, brother, where did you get this apple? He said, from the Garden of Eden. I said, I don't doubt it. This is the best apple I ever, I thought it was rolled in sugar. It was so good. He said, it's the only kind I eat, it's Fuji. So I've been a Fuji man ever since. Now there's different kinds of Fujis as well. We won't get into that. I won't tell you all my knowledge. Okay, we just don't have the time. There's different kinds of Fujis as well. But this is an apple. This came from a fruit tree. The fruit tree produced the apple. Listen to me, please. The apple is after the tree. Right. The apple is after the root has been planted. Yeah. This is the end and not the beginning. Right. Stay with me, please. All of us Christians are supposed to produce fruit in our lives. You say, preacher, time out. Some of us produce more than others. No, no, no doubt about it. The Bible even says some 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We know that. But there should still be some fruit on your tree. Amen. Every fruit tree... Spiritually speaking, in this room, should have at least a cherry on the tree. If you don't, there is a problem. We know that. The Bible says in Matthew, by their fruit, you shall know them. We focus on the fruit all the time. Preachers get up and preach on, are you producing fruit in your life? Are you growing as a Christian? By the way, nothing wrong with that. But I want you for the next few moments to forget about fruit. I don't think the focus should be the fruit. In fact, forget the fruit. Forget the fruit. Focus on the root. Amen. Focus on the root. Yeah. I thought, as a way of introduction, I thought to myself, why is it that so many Christians, so many people focus on the fruit today, and you hear nothing about the root? Yeah. I'm a simple preacher. I like to see things in my mind. I thought, why is it that people focus on the fruit and not the root? Number one, everyone can see the fruit. Right. No one can see the root. You see, when we walk in, we want people to say, oh, look, look who's here, Mr. Prayer Warrior. Mm -hmm. Look who's here. Oh, yeah, there's fruit on that guy's tree. Oh, yeah. I got a Bible question. I'm going to him. He'll know. We're very proud people, are we not? By the way, I'm preaching to me. Yeah. We want people to see that fruit. But you don't get fruit without the root. No. You don't get it. No, everyone can see the fruit. No one can see the root. You see, the fruit is way up high. The roots way down low. Yeah. I wrote this down. The fruit looks delicious. The root looks dirty. Yeah. Yeah. No one walks in and says, look at this dirty root. Let me hold that. No, you don't want that. Who would like a piece of root? I'll 
I'll pass. Thank you. Who would like an apple? I'll take that. I'll get what I can get, right? Sure. You see, the fruit is the end. The return. The root is the beginning of the investment. Amen. Here's the problem today, Christian. We want the result without the relationship. You're right. Yeah. All right. Amen. It won't happen. Your pastor asked me when I come, he said, would you give a challenge to my people? We're in the new year, 2024. I want to challenge you in this new year. I'm only here today. We leave tonight. I want to challenge you in this year that your focus be on the root and not the fruit. Amen. He said, preacher, you don't believe it's important for Christians to produce fruit today? Absolutely. But you don't get the fruit without the root. In Amen. fact, if you focus on the root, the fruit will come. Amen. Amen. But you know what we do? We fabricate fruit. Yep. Because we're here to please people, not God. Mm -hmm. Thinking that God doesn't know there's fake fruit on the tree. Right. You say, preacher, how do you know that's what we're doing today? I've done it in my own life. <gasps> and you're a preacher. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's days I put on the suit and I put the smile on and I come to church because I'm supposed to and I want people to see that I'm a glad, happy Christian. And actually, I didn't want to come to church that day, but I had to because I was preaching. <laughs> I couldn't stay home. Mm -hmm. Imagine telling that to a preacher. I was going to come, but I really don't feel like it. <laughs> We're going to stay in the hotel. We're good. But I'll be honest. Yeah. We're not going to say that. Why would we? I mean, that would only be the truth. I forgot to mention sarcasm is one of my gifts. <laughs> All right? It's true. Yeah, That's where we're at today. By the way, it's in our society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've, how many have seen reality television? How many realize that reality television is not real? Yeah. And we all know that, but yet, how many people? I mean, there'll be some show, or there's a show of mountain men. It's a, guys that live out in the rugged wilderness. And I, I kind of like, if I, if I want to watch something, that's more of my, my, my flavor. You know, I like the guy in Alaska with the beard full of, you know. I'd like to live. If it wasn't for ministry, you wouldn't find me. I'd be in Wyoming in the middle of nowhere. You wouldn't. The only person allowed to come down the, the driveway is the guy bringing the Cabela's box. That's it. That, that would be, <laughs> you know, that's just me. But unfortunately, we have to care about people and souls and all that stuff. You know? Right. That's what we're supposed to do. I can't live it to myself. I can't. No, that reality show. I've met some of them guys. I've done some things and been in different programs and shows. And uh, I met uh, Tom Orr, the fellow that shoots a bow. And I've, I've met, uh, of course, his brother, Jack, is a falconer, which I've read stories and, 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 um, and articles by Jack for years. I've got articles by him from back in the 80s. Um, I talked to a guy one time. He said he, he did some camera work for that show. He said, you, you ever seen the one where they, they, they pan in and you see this big giant field? And there's the big timber log house in the background with the big the big skylight windows in the front. And there's the snow-capped peaks. And you know, they're worried about the grizzly coming through and taking their livestock. And the music flares and they go to commercial. And you're thinking, what's going to happen? They're going to lose their livestock. The grizzly. Gets. He goes, do you notice they never show behind the house? I said, yeah, come to think of it. I never have seen the angle behind the house. He said, there's a highway there. <laughs> highway he goes there's always music playing when they pan they never give the actual sound that's going because you can hear truckers going down the road you know why because it's not real right. and we're used to that in our society today the problem is it's crept into the church You're right. yeah. and we think well everyone's fake so I'll be fake too but you're not here to impress people you're here to impress God right. it is he that sees you yeah. it is he that sees Amen. me I'm going to give you a couple things very quickly. We can't have this result without the relationship. I wrote this down. Fake fruit comes from no root. Fake fruit comes from no root. I want to give you four things quickly. I want you to see it right out of the text here. Just focusing on verse number three. The Bible says this man, this godly man is blessed. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He don't stand in the way of sinners. He don't sit to see the scornful. His delights where? In the law of the Lord, the word of God. In this law, he meditates. He, he chews what? Day and night. He lives in this book. Because of that, he's what? Verse three. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Number one, his root is planted. His root is planted. We're focusing on the root, not the fruit. His root is planted. Let me ask you something. Is your root planted? Now, we could go to John. We don't have the time to do that, but he's the vine. We're the what? The branches. And without the vine, he said, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. You need him. Listen, you don't have a tree, the branch does you no good. you got to have the tree. you got to be tied in. We know that, preacher. I already know that. His root is planted. 
Those that are planted in Christ are firmly fixed. Proverbs 12 says, the root of the righteous shall not be moved. That's what it says. Ephesians 3, Paul says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love. Listen to me. A tree can weather any storm if its root system is sound. Yeah. Yep. Sound. It's sound. So quit focusing on this. I want people to see that I have this in my life. Forget the fruit. Do you hear what I say, Christian? Forget the fruit. Focus on the root. Amen. Focus on the root. Focus on the root. The root is the relationship. Yep, that's, right. that's what you want. Preacher, I don't have any talents. You don't need them. Amen. Preacher, I'm not very good at this or that. Listen, it's all God. Yeah. It's all God. Amen. Yeah, preacher, you don't understand. No, you don't understand, my friend. Preacher, I'm nothing. Perfect. That's exactly what God's looking for. Amen. If you're something, he can't use you. Amen. God is great at taking nothing and making something. Amen. It's all God. It's all God. Amen. Fake fruit comes from no root. I wrote this down right after that. No fruit comes from no root. Yep. Right. I want to ask you a question. This is not a fair question. Would you rather have no fruit on your tree or fake fruit on your tree? It's the same thing. Yep. Right. We don't think that way. Well, I'd rather have fake fruit. No one would know. God does. Amen. You ever try to bite into a piece of fake fruit? Doesn't taste good. Not nourishing. It's not real. It's not real. Fake fruit comes from no root. No fruit comes from no root. Listen, but the Christian who's rooted in Christ is like a tree that's planted. His root is planted. Number one. Number two, quickly. His root produces. By the way, this is a rocket science. If a root is planted, it produces. Makes sense. And that's what it says in verse number three. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that what? Bringeth forth his fruit in his season. This root produces. Amen. My job and your job is to be tapped into the vine. Leave Amen. the fruit up to him. Amen. No, we're too busy trying to produce fruit. You don't have to produce fruit. You just be tapped into the root. Amen. That is a byproduct of the root. Amen. In fact, let me say it this way. You can't be tapped into Christ and not produce fruit. Amen. Not possible. Yes, not possible. You say, preacher, this is basic. Yes, but our church today, we're missing this. Amen. I go into church after church after church, Amen. and I see people that are loaded down, and boy, they look good from the outside. All this fruit, but it's all fake. It's not real. Amen. And guess what? They can't help each other because I can't reach and give you a piece of my fruit because it does you no good. There is no nourishment because it's not real. Mm. Yes, sir. Oh, I look impressive. But I do myself no good and nobody around me. No. I can't give to the lost world to eat. They don't eat fake fruit because it's not real. Right. No, the godly person, his root is planted. His root produces. I told you earlier, fake fruit comes from no root. No fruit comes from no root. What about little fruit? Little fruit comes from a shallow root. Hmm. Well, at least you have some, right? Yeah. Little fruit comes from a shallow root. In his season, the harvest always comes after the planting. In other words, you have to wait for the fruit. It takes patience. How many of you are patient? I don't have a lot of patience. It's not one of my gifts. My wife said, Amen. I'm the one preaching, so I'll be transparent. I have a problem with patience and my other vice, my other friend. Again, I'm being transparent. I'm, I'm as human as you are. I'm quick tempered, I'm short fused. Anyone else have a short fuse that's honest? Good, four people. I'm very short fused. Like, I don't really have a fuse. <laughs> like there. It's kind of an instant inferno now. Now, the good thing is it leaves quickly. Mine leaves very quickly, but also comes very quickly. I have a cousin that has a really long fuse. You can smack him across the face and he'll apologize to you. <laughs> he doesn't get mad. Now, when he does get mad, don't visit him for six months. <laughs> I'm not that way. I'm not that way. It leaves quickly. His root is planted. His root produces. Listen, little fruit comes from a shallow root. But I want you to see next. Listen, not only is his root planted, his root produces, his root is powerful. That's what the Bible says in verse 3. Don't miss it. And he should be like a true planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Listen, his leaf also shall not wither. 
The reason the Bible said this, it could have just said, listen, a strong tree produces fruit. And we would have got the gist of the verse. That's not what it says. It goes on to tell us that this root remains powerful. I took the time to say the word wither. It means to wilt. What does that mean, preacher? It means to lose freshness, to weaken. It means, if you look it up in the dictionary, the death of any tree. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die. I want to produce fruit for Christ. Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, the Bible says. So, fake fruit comes from no root. No fruit comes from no root. Little fruit comes from a shallow root. But much fruit comes from a deep root. So, his root is planted. His root produces. His root is powerful. Let me give you the fourth one. His root prospers. His root prospers. I like verse number three. I thought to myself, wait a minute. You're planted. You're bringing forth fruit in your season. You're, you're strong. You're powerful. Your leaf doesn't wither. And then it goes on. It doesn't stop there. By the way, that would be enough. It says, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wait a minute. How many things can a tree do? It produces fruit. And I mean, what do you mean? Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. How else can a tree prosper? It's producing fruit. What else can it do? It's talking about the quality of the fruit. Don't miss this, please. Don't miss this. His root prospers. Not only does his tree bring forth much fruit, but the fruit brought forth is the best. For instance, if this was a gala, and she says it is, it'd probably take three galas to reach one Fuji. <laughs> We're talking about quality versus quantity. Let me ask you that question. What kind of Christian are you? Do you have many pieces of fruit on your tree? Maybe you have fewer pieces than others, but the fruit you have is the best fruit there is. See, that's me. I'd rather, I'd rather have quality fruit than quantity of fruit. In other words, fake fruit comes from no root. No fruit comes from no root. Little fruit comes from a shallow root. Much fruit comes from a deep root. But the best fruit comes from the perfect root. Mm. Yeah. You do realize that the vine that we're tapped into is the best. Amen. Perfect. Yes, sir. If he is perfect and we're tapped into him, what are we supposed to be? Just ask him. What is a Christian? A little Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be. Why do we focus on the root? Listen to me. I'm done. It is the life source for the Christian. <clears throat> Can I help you with something? I'm finished. Fruit is not the goal of this church. That's our problem in our churches today. As I travel across America, they want to produce fruit so the world can see, so the community can see, so the church can see. We want to put our thumbs on our armpits and say, look at all the fruit we have. Can't fabricate fruit. Can I help you with something? Forget the fruit. Start focusing on Jesus. The church won't be able to hold the fruit. Focus on the root. Focus on the root. It is the life source for the Christian. Fruit is never the goal. Listen, the fruit is the byproduct of the root. Let me give you one more thing. Just think about this for a second. I really dwelt on this. I really was just thinking about this. Does the fruit benefit the tree? No. Have you ever seen a fruit tree eat its own fruit? The fruit is not for the tree. Can I help you with something? If you are a spiritual Christian in this church and you come in, you're a member of this church, you're to be an edifier of all those around you. Yes or no? Yes. You should produce fruit for who? Not for you. You know what I see as I travel across church today? People that produce fruit, the fake fruit, you made yourself. It's not even real. So we do this. Take my fruit. I did this. This is mine. Why would they want it anyway? It ain't even real. But a person that produces fruit, they want someone to take it. Amen. They're there producing it for others. If you're producing fruit, it's for others, not for you. You can't eat your own fruit. Right. Trees don't get their life source from their fruit. They get it from the root. Yeah, that's, that's where their life source comes from. You should be drawing your nutrients from the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more you draw your nutrients from him, the more fruit you produce, and the more of the help you are to those. Imagine a church full of people in 2024 that produces fruit the right way by being tapped in the root. 
what they can do with those around them. The lost get fed. The saved get fed. No one goes without food. You know what I see today as I travel across this country? Starving churches. Starving. We have the answer right here. But yet the churches are full of fake fruit. No real fruit. A simple message, folks. Please don't miss it. Focus on the root. Focus on the root. We yield fruit for the benefit of others and the glory of God. What do we need? We don't need anything. Verse number one, the first word says we are what? Blessed. We're blessed. Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In the quietness of this moment, perhaps the Holy Spirit